get more snacks. All right, get snacks. Get a refill on coffee. Hey, did anyone see where I put my coffee? Ah, there it is. Yep, let me turn my mic off. I mean, it's not a Oh, it's fine. I don't think it'll be a 30, 11, 20, perfect. Yep. They get my food either way, but, and it won't be here till 11, 30, so. Here, just keep an eye on me. All right, we're going to get started. 
By the way, I know this says an idiot's guide to public service loan forgiveness. Understand, y'all are not the idiots I am. If I could figure this out, y'all are good. You're way smarter than I am. So I'm the idiot in this case. Another thing, even if you're not thinking public service loan forgiveness, but you have federal loans, a lot of the steps we're going to cover in this are still extremely relevant to get you that $0 payment the first year, and in most cases where the Department of Ed is going to be covering your interest for you. So even if you're not thinking PSLF, do keep that in mind. This may still be for you. This is overall the full 10 years. By the way, you'll never hear me say this in class another time. Go ahead and get your phones out. At different points, we're going to have something up on there that says, add this to your calendar. I'll try and remind you on each one of these. I kid you not, we're going to be putting calendar reminders on your phone for the next 10 years. Don't worry. Your phones have a repeat this function feature. This is so that when you transfer phones and get new phones moving down the line, these calendar reminders go with you. And 10 years from now, if you're doing public service loan forgiveness, your loans will be gone, forgiven. All right, so here's our agenda. By the way, first I must acknowledge the person who originally wrote the bulk of this, it was not me. I am building off of Sarah Donnelly's um, work. She presented this at one of our national conferences a few years ago and made her original presentation available to us. I have tweaked it in ways that I find work a little bit better for my students, save y'all a little bit more money. But this was Sarah, and at the time she submitted the last update to all of us in the financial aid community, she was up to 76 of 120 qualifying payments. That said, here's also your cautionary tale. She chose to leave higher education and go work for a private for-profit company. This is why when I talk to y'all in your exit counseling sessions, you will hear me say to almost every single one of you, you really ought to consider something like a non-qualified investment account just in case. This is the just in case. She got an offer she could not refuse. She's very happy with that decision. And it pays higher than the state, uh, or higher than, than higher ed. Uh, so she was okay. She was able to pay her debt off, and I think she's done with it now, most likely. But I like having contingencies. The worst that happens is you have to use your contingency on the student loans. The best that happens is you use the contingency on whatever the heck you want. House, car, really nice vacation. I don't care. If you get your loans forgiven, it's your money to do with as you see fit. All right, now the agenda. Uh, we're going to hit a disclaimer. We're going to do an overview. And we're going to go over the typical timeline. That's actually where we're going to spend the bulk of our time on this. That's where we're going to get the, ca the phones out and put these calendar reminders in. I'm going to talk about some tips, what to do if you change jobs, what happens if you postpone payments, and what did the CARES Act do for y'all. Uh, and then I'm going to very briefly mention advocacy. The advocacy, by the way, is not going to be so much for y'all, but y'all advocating for other people who are going to come behind you and try and get loan forgiveness. You guys are about to have that MD by your name. I know we say it again and again during this IPM session. Once you have doctor as part of your name, your word holds weight. You, as far as politicians are concerned, are now part of the donor class. They listen to y'all more than they listen to me. Y'all also have lived it. I can go to them all day long and talk about my students' experiences. And it kind of goes in one ear out the other. I know, I've been doing Capitol Hill visits for the last few years. They're great, they're very polite, love going up there. A student goes, they listen, they give you all the time you want. I go up, great, thanks, that was a wonderful 30 minute uh, visit here. Take this picture and bye. Y'all's advocacy means a lot more. All right, so here's the disclaimer. This is accurate as of today. Some of these things, but only very minors, uh, minor of these things for the most part, could change. We could see new loan repayment. Last year when I did this, save was just a thought in someone's head as far as a loan repayment program. Here this year, it's the plan that 90% of you are going to go into because it's that much better for most of you. Some of these things change, 
usually they get better. Most of the time, if you're in something, you're going to get grandfathered in so you can keep it. All right, that's the disclaimer. Keep up to date. Have any questions down the road? Remember, May 29th, 2034, ask me anything before that. After that, you will not be able to find me. Some of my kids probably won't even be able to find me. Um, but you've probably already heard from, from Gabby down in our uh, development office. Make sure we have good contact information for you. The only students I was able to give updates on after, in this last year when SAVE became a thing and said, hey, you may want to consider this, were those that we could reach. If we can't reach you, I can't tell you. Feel free, by the way, to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Med School Money Guy. That's me. What? It sounded good. I got a logo at everything, y'all. Um, but it is cheesy. I, look, I got seven kids. Corny's all I do in, in terms of humor. Um, all right. Make sure we've got good contact information for you. Yes. Will I use it for that? Absolutely not. Will the development office use it for you? They may reach out. That said, they've been very respectful of what I told them early on when the school started, of trying not to contact folks until there is a high likelihood at least that their loans are paid for. Yeah. Um, I think they just this year contacted our charter class, and they graduated in 2016. So, and that's more kind of like, hey, y'all were the charter class. Do you want to do a 10-year anniversary gift for the school? Um, I was like, hey, actually, I have heard from a lot of them. They've, they've been paying off their loans, but some of them are doing public service. And so I'm like, stop asking my people for money. Sorry, I'm extremely protective over y'all. I don't like them to ask, and they generally do, do a good job of that. Now, will main campus alumni try and contact you on your student email account before that shuts down? They probably are. They did. So they already have. I have no control over that. I'm just talking about our local folks. Huh? I think six months. I think you get six months after school ends uh, for that to shut down. I am not the best person to ask on that. I literally still have the same email account USC gave me when I started as a freshman. And I've done two degrees and now worked here for 18 years. So I'm not the best example, but I think it's what, a year. One year, okay, one year. Um, for the most part, though, y'all already have your professional personal email accounts that are just your name or something like that. Um, if you don't get one, we, we kind of frown upon and employers frown upon like pet names and email, email addresses. We make fun of it when they come across our desks. Don't be that person. All right, overview. How do you qualify? This is like in a nutshell the most basic understanding. You've already had some of this this morning. Have eligible loans. If you have a direct unsubsidized loan or a graduate plus loan, you have eligible loans. If some of you have been in school for a little bit longer, I'm trying to be nice in the way I say that, and you have loans that are called FELP loans, Family Federal Education Loan Program. This was back in the days when the Department of Ed had private companies actually do the lending. We didn't pull the money straight from the U.S. Treasury. You may need to make sure those loans convert to a consolidation loan with the Federal Direct Loan Program. At that point, your ineligible loans become eligible. Okay? Make sure on that. Do you work for a qualifying employer? This one's another pretty easy one. 95% of you, 99% of you, are going to do this by accident. Is your employer a 501c3, nonprofit or not-for-profit, or are they a government agency, federal or state or local? So if your hospital's like run by the county, that counts. If your hospital is like Prisma and a not-for-profit, that counts. If your hospital's like St. Francis and a non-profit, it counts. If it's like MUSC and it's a state-run hospital, it counts. If it's like, I can never remember the name of the company, um, but the, well, no, I remember that one, but like what's the group down in uh, Myrtle Beach? It's, it is an HCA, but it's like HCA type. Grand Strand, thank you. They don't qualify. They're private for profit. If you're going to Asheville and it's an HCA hospital, but you're being paid by Mayhack, guess what? You qualify because Mayhack is a nonprofit. All right. Kind of how, how to understand. Yeah. Is this just like a list? 
There's not, but quite frankly, the best way to find it out is residency program, nonprofit. Go to Google, every residency program, every hospital system loves to put out there that they're nonprofit. Okay. Yep, because. Yeah, so it, I guess if you have your, your EIN. Um, yeah, for the most part, you don't get that until you get your first W-2. Um, and then you make 120 on-time payments. Three requirements for public service loan forgiveness. The last one being 120 on-time payments. The payments must have a bill attached. What do I mean by that? It means you can't pay ahead. It means you can't pay a lump sum because guess what? 120 payments, if I could make a lump sum based off my first year's payments, all of you would pay zero dollars, your loans would be forgiven, and we'd be done. Unfortunately, we can't do that. The government is slightly smarter than that, but only slightly. Um, but voluntary extra payments don't count. If you are going towards public service loan forgiveness, paying over your amount doesn't count and it's money thrown away. I'm telling you that up front. If you have that inkling, Put the money in that non-qualified investment account that we talked about earlier. So history and statistics. This started in 2007 as part of the CCRAA. I don't think most of you were even in college at that point. Um, anyhow, huh? <laughs> You're not graduating. You're mean. Um, all right. The very first possible forgiveness in the program was October of 2017. That would have been someone was in the program for 10 years at that point. As of last year in January, the Department of Education had forgiven 26 billion, it's a B, dollars, not, not, in, not only med students, they don't break it down, uh, but 26 billion dollars with an average forgiveness of 68,700. Guess what? It's you doctors that are driving up that average. There's like a big disparity between how much that is. It's mostly y'all and then everyone else getting like 20, $30,000 forgiven, um, which is fine. Of the people who got their money forgiven, 71.4% were in income driven repayment plans. Pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, income contingent, income based repayment, all of these. Some students did a hybrid where they were in those for part of the time, but finished on like um, standard repayment because that payment went down a little bit for them. Typically, that's not a thing anymore. Um, it, that was for early adopters. About little or around half of the rejections that we saw for this, because you saw these horrible news articles. Oh, students are not getting public service loan forgiveness. Well, why? They put the form out there to request forgiveness for everybody, and guess what? People one month out of school were applying for loan forgiveness. They're like, hey, I saw it. Is this the right form? I don't know. I'm going to submit it. We'll see what happens. Okay. Well, most of the people that had their forgiveness denied were because they hadn't been in repayment for 10 years, and most of those were really, really early on in repayment. Then another... 40% of rejections, so we've got kind of the, really the, the bulk of all of the rejections here, were because people didn't work for a qualified employer. Guess what? Back in the days in what we lovingly call the Wild West of public service loan forgiveness, there was no check that you could do every year to make sure your payments were counting. By the way, also, they were hand counting the payments. So if the person who collected your payment didn't go in and click the button that disqualified. Oh, oops, we're sorry. It's not a good answer to me, but that's all I said. Well, guess what? It didn't count. You were treated as you had not made 120 payments on those because they missed one. So now that brings us to present day. And the steps that I'm going to tell you to take, starting with this May, we have checks and balances on this. Every year you're going to get a checkup. We're going to make sure that you've got copies of all of your documents so that if the government does something, I'm not going to say they're going to do something shady, but if they're incompetent like they seem to be with this new FAFSA rollout, if y'all been following that, I'm sorry, you've had to read that. Um, or with most things that the government does. Well, you are protected. You're good to go. Hey, Amber's here with food. Um, can we put it all right here? Thanks, Amber. So... 
this May, May 3rd to be exact. That's how long from now? Anyone, anyone counting on that? Not long. You're going to go, you're going to walk across the stage, you're going to go back to this room downstairs in the Coger Center down in Columbia, and we will hand you your actual diploma. You are going to do step one. You are going to graduate, you are going to get that diploma. You're going to be doctor. It's always been one of my favorite things to do here, and I'm making the new registrar still let me participate in this. I get to be one of the first people to call you doctor. It's fun. I love it. All right, second thing you're going to do, you are going to complete my little checklist here. So if you want, you can take a picture of this. You can attach it to your calendar for May, we'll call it May 15th. You are going to make sure first that your employer for next year, your residency and employer, is a qualifying employer. Again, government employer, 501c3. You're going to double check by going to studentaid.gov that all of your loans qualify. You can pull up the list of your loans, and they will, should all say direct loans. If any of them have FFELP in front of them, guess what? Our next step we're going to do uh, in June takes care of that, but be aware that you have to double check these things, make sure it's working. Third step, you'll do this around May 15th, is you are going to download a copy of the master promissory note that you signed, and I guarantee you did not read. Anyone actually read it? If so, good for you. Uh, I didn't even read mine. Um, so you're going to download and save every one of them. This is the start of our CYA file, covering your assets. I was about to say, hopefully someone got I didn't make that up. I stole it. Um, so you're going to do that. So here's your how-to. You're going to graduate. You're going to get these things. Go to studentaid.gov. Click, by the way, this is going to be out on the website uh, or out on my YouTube channel. You're going to click on view my documents. It looks like this. Hey, there's a screenshot up there. You're going to filter just your master promissory notes because guess what? Some of you have multiple promissory notes. Maybe you signed it five times because for some reason it wasn't coming through. Maybe on the other hand that you signed it five times because you just didn't know if it went through. Maybe you have grad plus loans and direct unsubsidized loans. Download them all. I don't care. Every single one of the ones that you signed had a provision in it. And that provision says that you will be offered the option of public service loan forgiveness. I'm not saying the government's nefarious. I'm saying they're incompetent. If they lose that, but you've got a copy, you're still good. That has already been challenged in court. The Department of Ed tried to make a few changes under one of the, uh, one of the administrations. The lawyers, because guess what? It became very hard a few years ago to get a job as a lawyer, had a lot of free time on their hands, and they had the backing of a lot of doctors who were going for public service loan forgiveness. Good combination. Those of you with money and those who know how to file lawsuits and with a lot more free time. They sued the Department of Ed, and they won because of that provision that is in your promissory notes. That said, they cannot make a substantive change that makes people ineligible for this program. There is a court case on the books now proving that. That's a lot of y'all's protection there. It's already been vetted by the courts. So go and download these. Save them on the flash drive. Save them on a Google Drive. I don't care where you save them. Make sure it's something you will not lose. All right. So, again, sticking with the May 15th. May 15th is going to technically be your separation date from the university. If you tried to enter repayment right now, I'm going to come back to this statement in just a second, but if you tried to enter repayment right now on your direct unsubsidized loans, you can't do it. You're still in school. Some of you have already gotten contacted about entering repayment and doing the save plan. Guess what? That's only for your grad plus loans. There's an accidental caveat in the law that allows you to go ahead and file for your grad plus loans doesn't mean it counts towards public service loan forgiveness because you're not yet working for a qualified employer, but does freeze the interest. Then, of course, when USC reports your enrollment again next month, it kicks you back into repayment or back into the in-school deferment. Basically, it ends up being a headache for y'all. Uh, I don't, at this point, I'm not recommending anyone go and constantly redo that. You can if you want. It's a, more of a headache than it's worth. Now, that said, you, on May 15th, are going to be officially separated from the university. You will have graduated. You'll be good to go. 
your start of your six month grace period happens then. So on your direct unsubsidized loan and on your grad plus loan, that starts a six month grace period that cannot be changed or shortened or skipped by law. You're like, well, Casey, I've already had my exit counseling session with you. Why are you telling me to consolidate my loans? Well, guess what? A consolidation loan is a new loan. You are replacing your direct unsubsidized loans and your grad plus loans with a new loan that you don't have to take a, gra a uh, grace period on. So May 15th is, is when that's gonna happen. Realistically, you probably aren't gonna be able to do anything on May 15th. This is just for your information. June 1st, on the other hand, see there's that emblem that says put this on your calendar. Yes. including undergraduate loans, also any grad plus loans. Yep, so it could be direct subsidized loans as well. So any direct loan from the government shows up on your federal uh, account on studentaid.gov. So yeah, sorry, I should have specified that. I've been working in med school so long I forget about subsidized loans. June 1st, this is the time for all of you, almost all of you, I know a few of you I've told you, hey, remember when I give dates, give a plus one on the month. This is your time to remember that. But for most of you, June 1st, you're gonna wanna go in to studentaid.gov and consolidate your loans. So how do I do that? This is the how-to guide. First, you need to know why. Why are we doing this? The basic reason why is we wanna start repayment right away. And you're like, well, Casey, why do I wanna start payment before I have a paycheck? Well, your payment's probably gonna be zero. If it's not zero, it's gonna be very low. And if it's not zero, it means that you had a substantial income, either you or a spouse in the last year. Um, most of you, that's not the case. So your payment's zero. So why then am I consolidating and starting repayment? So that I can get six extra months of payments as a resident and six less months of payments as an attending. I kid you not, for the, most of, for the bulk of you, we are talking a savings of about seven to $10,000 just by doing this, and it doesn't even change what you're paying on these six months. It's six months of $0 payments. Okay, it doesn't cost you anything. So we're starting it now, we're remo removing the grace period so we can do that. Yes? So you said on June 1st. That gives us time to get paperwork processed. Oh no, July 1st is the next step. That's, that's, our, that's our next date in the calendar. Okay. Yep, June 1st is the day you're doing this. Yeah, yes? Is this gonna be um, the time where I upload it to Canvas? Yep, to it'll be uploaded on Canvas and it'll be on the YouTube channel. Okay, cool. So you, and you can look at last year's and the year before that. I keep them all out there so that people can see how things changed. But yeah, this will be the new one. Um, all right, how do I do this? Log in to studentaid.gov. Guess what, you start out here a lot. Studentaid.gov, select manage my loans, it's one of the tabs on top, consolidate my loans. And then you're gonna follow a whole bunch of clicks and within the application, one of the options is gonna be, first, what repayment plan do you wanna do? Do you wanna do an income driven plan? Okay, based on that, do you wanna do save or pay as you earn? Most of you, that answer is save. If it's not save, we've likely already talked or will talk about it, there are a few of you who Pay as you earn is not, or pay as you earn is a better option, but it's very few of you, and there are some risks associated with it. So that's why we do exit counseling individually, not just as a large group. There, some of y'all can take advantage of this. You're going to also go through this, and it's going to ask you, are you interested in public service loan forgiveness? And you're like, well, why am they? Why are they asking me that? The answer is because they're going to then assign you to potentially a different servicer for your loans. Y'all may and may not know this because you have only ever gotten co communication from one. There are five federal servicers for student loans. Only one of those, Mohila, handles public service loan forgiveness. If you're hearing this and you're like, well, Casey, I'm not doing PSLF, I know I'm not, I don't care what servicer you have. If you are doing PSLF or if there's even the slightest chance you do PSLF, you want to click that box and you want to have your loans transferred over to Mohila. And it's month. Montana Area Health Education, something like that, I don't know. Uh, they used to be a, a state-run organization, now they only manage federal loans. This is what it looks like. Click start, follow the links through. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yep. 
if I'm deferring during the first year of residency, it doesn't make sense to call, consolidate my loans. Just wait and do it. But can you still apply for public service loan forgiveness? Absolutely. You so you don't apply you don't technically apply for public service loan forgiveness until you're ten years out anyway. Okay. So the first year payment or when you would be making a payment, right. you're deferring. And I would actually write out my six month grace period in that time and then defer for six months. Okay. So that when I can get that restarted, I can go into save with the low payment. Right. Yep. All right. Now, July first, we're gonna put this on our calendar. And you're gonna do this every year for 10 years so july 1st get that phone out go to july 1st of this year put on your calendar complete the employment certification form the ecf you're like casey why am i doing this i haven't made any payments yet this by the way is also when your payments will technically start even though again most of you at zero dollars so you're going to go out you're going to on July 1st, complete this form. You're probably gonna take it with you to the HR office on your first day officially being a resident. Not the training period before that. They don't, they don't count you the same before then. But you're gonna begin employment. You're doing this so that we can prove to the Department of Ed, hey, I'm working at a qualified employer. They're gonna go ahead and approve that employer. Also gives you a heads up in case there's some issue, your employer hasn't filed something correctly and they're, or they're not on the list that the Department of Ed approves for some reason. It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, we want to know soon. And this gives you a chance to find that out. So you begin employment, you start your residency, you're working there, you get them to do that form. You're going to create an account on Mohila if you don't already have one. Again, you should have one by this point. Sometimes it does take them a little bit longer. Y'all likely know that the federal restart of repayment back in October did not go well any better than the new FAFSA did. So maybe your account isn't created and you can go create one on your own. You're gonna download the form, you're gonna fill it out, you're gonna print it. Y'all, for the posterity of, and, and for the sake of everyone in this process, please type on the forms. Your doctors, we know, we know what your handwriting looks like. Type on the forms. Look, my mom told me I should have been a doctor with my handwriting, so I do it too. Fill out as much of the form as you can, go to your employer. You likely won't have your employer identification number yet. They'll fill out the rest. I kid you not, it's a five minute process. But on July 1st, they probably have a big stack of these things because everyone do, is doing them every single year. So you may just have to leave it and get it back from them later. Once you get the form back, hopefully day of, but if not, you know, whenever you get it back, you go and you upload that form to Mohila. They've got a place to upload it and then they will review it and approve your employer. So what's that form look like? I kid you not, the bulk of what you're gonna fill out Oh, that's, uh, you can't see that up there. The bulk of what you're gonna fill out is on the top of that left-hand side. And then the website looks a little bit different from this now. They've made a few updates since I lost my access to it. Um, but it look, still looks basically the same, just a little bit prettier. Uh, and it says, you know, public service loan forgiveness, employment certification form, it's where you download it. It's also where you upload it back. Very simple. So now we've consolidated, repayments officially started usually around July 1st again. Go and review your loan servicer's website. The first year, by the way, has the most that you'll have to do for, most of the, for the, almost the entire 10 years. You're gonna review your loan servicer's website to see how you make a payment. Can you do it online? Do you have to do it by mail? No one does things by mail anymore. Just set up an auto draft, even if that auto draft is zero dollars. Couple benefits to that. You can do that direct debit. You're, it's not charging you anything for it. Like if you tried to pay your university tuition with a credit card, heaven help you, that was a 4% fee on 20 grand. Um, but free service, if you sign up for direct debit, you also get a reduction in your interest rate. It's like a quarter percent. Doesn't affect you so much at the beginning. If you choose to leave public service later and you're starting to make payments on this, it could be a little bit of a help. Again, for most of you, $0 payment on July 1st. If you're in save, $0 payment, and the Department of Ed is covering all of your interest on those loans. So you don't, you're not in what we call a negative amortization. Your loan balance is not going up if you're in save as soon as you enter repayment. If you're in pay as you earn because of reasons that we've discussed in your one-on-one -on -one meeting, 
your loan balance is a negative amortization. So that is part of that calculated risk that we are taking to get more loans forgiven. All right. Now we're going to get to next February. Another one to put on your calendar. Download on February 1st your 1098E or your 1098INT. Guess what? This is the interest on your student loans that at this point you probably haven't paid any, but if you have, you want to be able to deduct that from your taxes. Also, first year only in residency and in repayment, you want to still remember to go back and, and download your 1098T from Self Service Carolina. Guess what? You're not going to get an email reminder about it. I'm sorry. It doesn't, the, the system doesn't do it. I, your 1098T, it's the same form you've been getting for all four years, whether you knew it or not. Judging by the questions, a lot of you didn't know it. This is basically what did you pay last year in tuition? Now that you have an income, that's a tax write-off. That's a good money tax write-off. <coughs> so be sure to do that. But you'll only do it again for that first year. Now it's getting closer to tax time. Get your 1098E form. You get that directly from your servicer, which again is most likely Mohila. And any interest you paid is tax deductible up to a certain amount. Early on, you won't be hitting that limit. I can't remember what the limit is. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. It's going to be under a tax information tab or a downloads tab. Now, another one to put on your calendar. May 1st of next year. So go forward a little bit. Now it's time, if you didn't select the automatic renewal on your consolidation application, definitely recommend selecting automatic renewal of your income-driven repayment plan. It's time to recertify that and submit your new documentation. You may not have to do this, again, if you did that automatically. Highly, highly, highly recommend this. Automate as much of this whole process as you can. It's also time, no matter what, to recertify your employment. So last year you did it on July 1st, or technically this year. Next year you're going to do the employment certification on May 1st. Just to go ahead and get it out of the way, make sure those payments are counting like they're supposed to. You're going to get that. You're going to set this to repeat in your phone for nine more years on May 1st. Why not 10? Well, because you're already a year in. For the... The employment certification form, no. On July 1st, that one doesn't need to repeat okay. yearly. Um, we're going to have another one on July 1st that we start a year out that you will repeat yearly. <coughs> Sorry, tell me to slow down if you don't need to. All right, so again, studentaid.gov, reapply for your chosen repayment program if you didn't already select to do it. The instructions are there. You can take a picture of it. Of this year, so as soon as you start employment. And then we re the next time we recertify it will be in May, not in July. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Now, that said, in July 1st of next year, so July 1st, 2025, and this one you will put on here, you are going to check your repayment status. You're going to make sure that they approve that employer certification form, and you'll be able to download that. <coughs> you will also be able to get a, a letter from them saying you are now at because it was done in May, you'll probably be at 10 of 120 qualifying payments for public service loan forgiveness. These are your annual checkups that you must do. Tracking it is vital. This is your CYA file. So if you're changing employers, I'm going to cover that in a little bit. Okay. But basically you do... I closing, I'm closing out with this employer. I'm going to recertify with them. I'm starting a new employer the next day. I'm starting a certification form with them. It's a couple of extra steps, but it's worth doing. Yep. So how do we track this? Well, the good news is they've made it a lot easier. They give you bar graphs and everything now. Um, it's changed a little bit. TEPSLF was a temporary expansion of public service loan forgiveness. That expired last year. That was to cover people who got bad advice early on from the servicers who were told wrong things like, oh, you can do extended repayment. You can't do extended repayment and do public service loan forgiveness. It doesn't work that way. Um, I don't want to blame the servicers entirely on that because the Department of Ed gave bad guidance early on. 
Uh, and so Congress approved an extra, I think, $2 billion just for people who got that bad advice. So yours won't show the TEPSLF section of this, but you will show the you know, tracker there, 10 out of 120, 12, 24, 48, so on, so forth, whenever you actually do it. It's a really good breakdown. I've actually found this to be extremely helpful. I've helped a lot of friends. I've helped some of our faculty member here get their loans forgiven. And, and we use this for status updates along the way. You know, it's gonna let you know, did your qualifying employer get approved? Like I just said, did those get, payments get approved based on that? Do we still need an employment certification? Was it not processed for some reason? Yes. Yeah, it'll be a lot more simple. You'll only show one loan instead of three. Yep. This person did not consolidate their loans because she didn't know she was going to be doing it early on. Yep, they were already in repayment. Yep. Whole thing will be on YouTube. Whole lecture. All right. Yep. No problem. All right, so now we've done it, we've checked, we've tracked it, we've checked it. And we're gonna download and save everything. You're gonna check your payment, you're gonna take a screenshot of that, you're gonna save it in the file. You're gonna download the letter that shows you how many qualifying payments you've had, you're gonna save it in the file. You're going to get a copy of where they approved your employer, you're gonna save it in the file. Download and save every single thing. You will likely never need it. But just in case, I want you to have it. Because at the end of the day, if the government screws something up as they are wont to do, you have the documentation. Or let's say, and this hasn't happened in, in years, let's say they don't count one of your payments right. They say it was a non-qualifying payment because it was late or something. Well, dagnabbit, I can prove I was on auto draft. And if it was late, it was y'all's fault. I can go back and dispute that in that year and they'll fix it. They're really good actually about fixing it. I will give them credit on this. Mohila has been good about this. Uh, doesn't happen very often, often anymore, but when it does, they're good about fixing it. It's a lot easier to fix things the year they happen as opposed to trying to fix it 10 years down the road. Don't, you know, double check these things year after year. Yep, year, year after year after year. That's why, that's why on July 1st, you've got the reminder to set in there to repeat for nine years, download everything. Yep. All in all, folks, this should not take you more than about 40 minutes a year to maintain this stuff and keep it going. First year, a little bit more. After that, we're making it as easy as possible, and it shouldn't be more than about 40 minutes a year. All right. Download all of your payment history. I've already mentioned this one, but this is the how-to on that. It's still gonna show your first payment you ever made. You're still gonna download that every year. You don't want the ones just for the last year. You wanna download everything. Show it all. Look, in the end of the day, if something happens, you want every bit of data possible. Inundate them with data so they can go, you know what, even if we can't make sense of it, this person's right. <laughs> what? It's true. Again, we're dealing with the government. All right, now go to July 1st, 2034. I'm retired at this point, y'all. Now you have made your 120th payment. You aren't gonna have to set this one up to repeat. You're gonna do this one time. So go in your calendar, July 1st, 2034. You have a new form that you can download and fill out. I just helped one of our faculty member do this last year. It was a lot of fun. That form says, I have made my payments. I am done. You're going to submit that form. It's the PSLF forgiveness form, not the employment certification form anymore, the actual forgiveness form. You're going to fill that out. You're going to get your employer to sign it. Nowadays, actually, Mohila's gotten better. You can send it directly to your employer through the online portal. I like paper copies. Um, that's just me. Still submit electronically, and you have to. You're going to log into Mohila, manage repayment, click on loan forgiveness, submit the form. Oh, wrong button. And now you're clicking request loan forgiveness. 
By the way, it shows up after 110 payments. You can't, submort, you can't submit the form until 120 payments are done. This is one of the things that they did to stop all the people applying way too early. They didn't make the form available until you had 110 payments. You're going to submit it, and you're done. In a couple of months, you are likely going to get a letter that says your loans are forgiven. Last year, graduation day, I was driving back from Columbia, got a call from one of our faculty members. Like, why is this person calling me? They never call me. Casey, I'm calling you before I call my mom. Oh gosh, what happened? What's going on? And why would I be in this list? Let me read you this letter. We are pleased to inform you your public service loan forgiveness has been approved and a, a balance of $157,000 has been forgiven. This is one of the faculty members I started working on earlier in their career while they were here at the School of Medicine. 150K forgiven. We've seen this work. In the past, years, I have a past few years, I have a lot of friends who have had their loans forgiven. We're seeing it work. And oddly enough, it's getting easier because of these new checks and balances that have been put in place. The early few years, they didn't have any of these things that you all have access to now. We see it work. That said, there's still some tips you want to know. Track everything. Everything. Keep copies. Stay organized. Y'all, I, I love having a really organized filing system on, on my computer. That's me. Don't just toss everything in there willy-nilly. Save it. Use a, a uniform-like title on this. This is my ECF that I submitted 2024, ECF 2025, ECF job change 2026, blah, 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 however you want to do it. Keep it pretty detailed. But it takes two seconds to just type it in. Stay organized. Keep the annual records. Things that we just covered, the reminders we just put into your calendars. Keep it somewhere you can find it. Thumb drives, oddly enough, as solid state drives tend to be pretty safe and pretty good. Not like the old CDs and stuff that we used to burn. None of you remember that, do you? Okay, a few of you. Okay, you may have had music CDs, but a lot of you were already using thumb drives for music and stuff by the time I was... No? Okay. You, okay, so you burn your mixtapes or your mix CDs. All right. Man, I haven't had a student who referenced LimeWire in a few years. This is a good day for me. <laughs> I do not advocate illegal downloading of music just because this is going online. Um, all right. Next thing. I said I would go. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll go back. I haven't heard that even through the, the financial aid community yet. Oh, oh, no, I do know what you're talking about. They're not, it's still going to be Mohila. The Department of Education is trying to do um, what USC kind of tried to do a number of years ago and create one portal, regardless of who is servicing your loans. We expect that in the next couple of years. What that means, expect it to be laid, delayed another three or four years after that. Because, again, FAFSA rollout this year was a total and epic disaster they're dealing with that still and that's going to push this other thing on the on the wayside for a little bit so they're not actually taking over administration they're just going to be the all-encompassing portal for it yep so when you submit your application you can stop making payments absolutely generally speaking I would say make the next few few payments. They will get refunded to you. So let it keep going. Say, for example, you accidentally applied a month early somehow, some way. Well, then they'll take that next month payment. You can resubmit the form. Unfortunately, they won't take the first one you submitted. It goes by the signature date. But I let it do that and then wait for the reimbursement. Y'all will be attendings. It won't be all that bad at, at that point. Now, I'm not going to wait for it to clear from the system before I stop making payments. Once I got the letter, I'm good to go. Stop those payments. Get that reimbursement. But yeah, one, once I get the letter, I, I would stop my payments. So you're paying up until you get the letter? I pay up until I get that letter. All right. You've changed jobs. You know, some of you are changing jobs sooner than others. Some of you are changing jobs maybe never again for your whole life. That's okay. 
if you change jobs, you're gonna do an employer certification form as you are leaving the employer you were at previously. You're going to do a new one your first day at the new employer. What we are showing here is that there is no lack, no gap in employment. That my qualifying payment in July of this year is just as good as my qualifying payment in August of, this, of the same year. Yep, transition year, first year in Spartanburg sort of thing. I know there's a few of y'all doing that. Um, your employer changes hands, the hospital changes names. I'm still submitting one. Uh, it may, it, like Prisma went from Greenville Health System, it's changed names three times since I've been here, y'all. And one of those was a major change that changed their employer identification number. They went from Greenville Health System to Prisma and now encompass like half the state, two thirds of the state, really. Well, Testing, testing, okay. Ooh, this mic's hot. All right, so job changes, submit a new one. It's really that simple. If you find yourself in a situation where you, where you need to postpone repayment, you can do it. It is not recommended for most people, but there are a few situations. Again, this is why we do individual counseling. There are a few situations where it makes a lot of sense and where you need to do this. So if you need to do it, you are going to contact your residency program and you're going to request, quote here, mandatory medical residency forbearance. They are obligated by law if you are in a medical residency to give you this forbearance if you ask for it. Understand though, that if you could have had a zero dollar save payment, you would be in a better position to take that. If you are not able to do that, this forbearance is possibly a good option if you find yourself where you cannot make your payments that year. But what it means is that that interest is gonna start accruing again. And that interest is going to then, at the end of the year, be capitalized. If you don't know what I mean by capitalized, they're gonna take that interest, they're gonna convert it to principal. Yep, oh, I gotta stop clicking these things. Go ahead. So the question was, is this different from if you have to go on a medical leave? Um, interest does not accrue on those for your subsidized loans. It will still accrue on unsubsidized loans. Interest never stops on an unsubsidized loan, which is anyone you've had here and Grad Plus. Um, they have different titles, but they work exactly the same. Yep. Um, yep, this is how I would do it. Now, that said, if you're on medical leave but you're technically still employed, I would instead submit a change to my income on my save plan or my pay as you earn plan because I'm still employed. Those payments may drop to zero or whatever my income is on leave and reduce it, still make the payments, still get that benefit. Yep, only, you know, in that situation, only do it if it's a terminal leave that you're never going back. All right, but it is an option. It's there if you ever need it. Um, but of course it doesn't count. Uh, the CARES Act, for y'all, the real benefit is for three years of your medical school career, you didn't have any interest accrued. These are the dates up there, a little bit less Im important for y'all. Uh, and interest restarted on October 1st of last year. But these are most of the, most of the dates and how it works. It's also proof that if any of you were in repayment at that time, or if you have family or friends that were in repayment at that time, the administrative forbearance created by the CARES Act did count towards their public service loan forgiveness time. So you can explain that to your other residents who are kind of up there, um, maybe didn't hear that. All right, another thing. This is a big topic in the news. Part of it, it shows up all the time on my Google feed just because this is my field, but, you're gonna see it pop up. You need to evaluate the news sources you're seeing because a lot of them, it's clickbait. 
it's fanciful titles and things like that that don't have any substance whatsoever. So when you're looking at this, when you see anything about this, I want you to evaluate what's that source. Who's writing the article? Is it a NASFA, National Association of Financial Aid Administrators, uh, white paper? Ooh, ooh, okay, that one's actually good. Is it your local newspaper or MSN or Fox or what? I don't care where you get your news. Uh, is it one of those? Is it a journalist who knows nothing about student loan repayment writing based on a five-minute conversation with someone about it? Is it an opinion piece? Is it an industry expert? Who is writing that? Where is the article coming from? Is it newspaper, online news sources? Is it a blog? Is it you know, Just evaluate that. It's not to say they're wrong. It just means I need to take it and evaluate my news on this with a, uh, with a little bit of a grain of salt. And so now I'm going to evaluate the content. Is it a recap of old news? We see this a lot. Google tries to pretend a lot of these things are new articles, and it's the same one I've read 15 times, picked up by another news source. Is it talking about a proposed bill? Guess what? Proposed bills don't mean squat until they pass. And then you need to pay attention. But if it's proposed, if it's just been put out there, how many of you have heard about the Educate Act by Dr. Murphy in Congress? Okay, don't read it. It'll like make you angry. Um, but I got a concerned email from one of our faculty members saying, hey, look at this. This could be a big deal for the school. It could compromise our financial aid for the whole school. I went and I looked, oh, this is just a proposal. There's like no chance of this passing. Um, so, you know, proposed bills. And if it's a proposed bill, is that bill even out of committee? A lot of bills get proposed just so people can try and get reelected, say they're doing something. You can tell I don't like politicians that much. Um, until they get out of committee, the House or the Senate's not even going to vote on them. I don't pay attention to any bill whatsoever until it hits that point. And even still... Chances are these days it ain't going to pass. All right. Double AMC has a good handout. Now, any more questions? You ask, I will try and answer. You might have to yell some of your Yeah. Yeah, so if you're doing safe plan, you're working towards public service loan forgiveness, but you find yourself in the amount of money to pay off all of your loans, you could do that. It's still not always the right answer for everybody. You may be much better off saving that money for something else and getting public service. Uh, so do evaluate that again on a case-by-case -case basis, but you have that ability. There's never a prepayment penalty on any of your federal loans. All right, any other questions? This is me just telling you when to start it. You can do it anytime in July. You could wait till August, but you're wasting a month. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I, I just like as early as possible. So July 1st gives me a whole month to maybe procrastinate a little bit because that's my nature. Yeah, so if you've used up your grace period in one way, shape, or form, maybe you uh, – you, took a year off before coming to med school, maybe you took a leave of absence, maybe you took a research year, something like that, I would say your dates are still the same. You're still going to want to enter repayment as early as possible. There's no way the Department of Ed's even going to get the updates and be able to start it sooner. Are there any more? Yes. So... Yeah, so how does loan consolidation affect your interest rates? What it does is it takes what we would call a weighted average of those interest rates. So how much money you have at a particular interest rate gets entered into a formula, and then they create a hybrid interest rate based on all of that. My understanding of it is that if you consolidate versus don't consolidate, at the end of repayment, you're looking generally within a $100 across a 10-year 10 10 thing. So it's a very minor change. Anybody else? Hearing none. Do you all want them to get their lunch first, or do you all want to talk first? Oh, oh Dr. Pace wants you. Thanks, Casey. You guys give Casey a hand for that. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, so just a couple of things. We, we need your attention a little long, just a little bit longer. Um, and for that, we're, we will feed you. Um, 
but before you form the line, let me just cover a couple of things. Um, one is uh, just a big thank you to the M2 class and to Eric Baker who allowed the gates to be open so you could park down there. It's a trial, and so if you see a M2s, tell them thank you. 